I'm sorry, ladies, that um, men are quick to call women emotional. I'm sorry. I need you to forgive us, ladies. Before we go any further, I'm so sorry that culture and movies and TV shows, they label women the emotional ones. When men are the most emotionally train-wrecked people on the planet. Men, l men, listen, I love you guys. Don't you dare tune me out over the next few weeks. Don't you dare walk in here going, well, well, I hope my wife's paying attention because I'm not emotional. Shut up. Yes, you are. We all are. But I, I've, I've admitted before, I've confessed before, from this platform, I'm an emotional train wreck. I, you, you ought to see me get excited, boy. I can get real excited. You ought to see me, bro. When I'm excited, I am, I'm almost uncomfortable to be around when I'm excited about something. You should also see me sad. It's not pretty. It's not pretty. And I'll tell you, like, have, being a dad has made me more emotional, especially in the sadness realm. I'm not sure I cried very much my entire life, but when I became a dad, show me a commercial with a good dad in it, and I'm sad for the next hour. Right? I cannot, I, can't, I, bar I can barely watch movies with a good dad in the movie. I can't even make it through it, you know, because I'm like, he loves his babies. And I'm like sad for a long time. And I'm like, you know, I just, I'm, a, I'm, I, if you make me angry, it's a problem. I can get angry. I can blow up. And, and so I, it's always so funny to me watching television shows or movies and stuff. And, and they say without saying that men are like the stoic, emotionless one in the relationship, and women are the ones that have emotions. Men don't know men. And it's like that could not be farther from the truth. Have you ever been to a football game? Anybody ever been to a football game? Just went to one, watched the Bucks lose. That was tough a couple weeks ago. But when the Bucks had a pro, like the, let's say when Tom Brady threw one of his interceptions, or the Bucks fumbled, or the Bengals scored, I did not look across the sea of red at Raymond James Stadium and see a bunch of men rationally thinking about what just happened. The men were not standing there going, huh, I am quite bothered by the result of that play. Is there anyone else among us who is having a hard time processing what we just witnessed? Let us remain emotionless, however, because as men, we are emotionless creatures. That's not what happened. I saw grown men yelling insults at professional athletes. But grown men who got cut from their JV football team calling professional football players bums. On the verge of tears, yelling, red skin, angry, frustrated, hanging their head, leaving, pouting. I saw grown men, oh, stupid, run the ball more, stupid, the books suck, hit the books, stupid Tom Brady. <laughs> Call that a, mo no, I've never been on a golf course and seen a guy slice one into the woods and then just be like, huh, I must take a moment in order to think about and understand the result of that last shot. Let me think about it rationally. Let me take a step back and get some perspective. No, they're yelling cuss words and screaming at each other. Like me So men, don't tune me out. Ladies, don't tune me out. We have all been made in the image of God and all of us have emotions. All of us. But here's the problem. All of our emotions are, are to be understood and observed and experienced in a world that is completely corrupted by sin. So things that might seem good are corrupted because of the sinful heart that we have. And so there are emotions like anger that we'll talk about next week, and I cannot wait. I can't wait to talk about anger because anger is actually a neutral emotion. There's nothing wrong with anger. The problem is, is that because our hearts have been corrupted by sin, we have a hard time expressing anger at the right things. But today, though, let's talk about joy. Why not? 2023. We have, we have resolution makers all over the house. And they're all over our social media page. This year's gonna be different. Yes, of course it is. Of course. 
right? The calendar changes, so that means your whole life changes. Of course it does, right? But here's what's funny about resolutions. Here's a common thread among resolutions. Whether it's weight loss or find a spouse or get a job or a better job or eat healthier or whatever it is, all of it is in pursuit of joy. All of it. And what's happening underneath the resolutions, everybody on your Facebook page, everybody on your Instagram and Twitter and TikTok that's posting about resolutions, all of it, regardless of what it is, it's a search for joy. It's a journey towards joy. It's, it's, it's you, know, you know how I'm going to be uh, more joyful? You know how I'm going to have more joy in my life? I'm going to lose 10 pounds. Yeah, that'll do it. You know, you know, you know it's not good. I'm going to get a raise. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make $2,000 more a year. Yes, of course. That's going to do it for you. You know? Oh, I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and that's going to do it for me. No, it's not. Right? But all of us are just in this pursuit of of, of being more joyful, or sometimes we, we misunderstand joy and we just want to be more happy, and so we make these promises to ourselves. We, we make these commitments to ourselves, and we're, we're all in on this. And I want to help you understand today, I want to help us all understand today that joy is infinitely more accessible than you ever thought possible. In fact, regardless of what's happening in your life, you can experience a joy that's so spectacular, it's a kind of joy the world can't offer. It's a kind of joy you can't obtain on your own, but it's a kind of joy that can change your life. Philippians chapter 4. It's written by a man named Paul. We're going to be in chapter 4 today. But what's interesting about this book, it's a short book. It's four chapters. Sixteen times in this book, Paul, the author, references joy. He says things like, I am overwhelmed with joy. I have so much joy. He commands us to rejoice as he rejoices. And when you read it on the surface, if you just read the book with no historical context, you'd think homeboy's writing from a beach somewhere or a mountaintop or like from a beautiful place in the world where he's taking in the scenery, he's taking in all the beauty, he's taking in all of the wonder and glorious elements of nature, and he's talking about joy. We've come to nickname this book the Book of Joy. So you think, man, he's got to be in the best place of his life. You know where he is? Death row. Chained to a Roman guard awaiting his own execution for preaching the gospel, and yet he's writing about joy. So obviously, joy cannot be dependent on our circumstances, amen? Obviously, joy has nothing to do with what's going on around you. Obviously, joy has nothing to do with your current situation. So if you're here and you've already tuned me out, you've been like, man, you talk about joy today, preacher boy? You don't know what my marriage is like. You don't know what my kids are like. You don't know what my job is like. You don't know what I'm going through. Well, here's what I know. Whatever your situation is, it doesn't threaten your joy. Because the Apostle Paul here is going through a situation that none of us would trade our own situation for, but yet he's writing the book of joy. Verse 4, Philippians chapter 4. four. Rejoice, no, go back, go back, sorry. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. The title of my message today, if you're a note taker, The Journey to Joy. The Journey to Joy. We're going to walk through this together verse by verse, and we're going to we're going to pull some truth out of Scripture. As you begin 2023, if, if one of your goals or resolutions or, or commitments to yourself was you're going to get into God's Word, right? You're going to, you're going to read God's Word. You're going, to, you're going to do more Bible study. and th I think that's great and wonderful and amazing. And there's a lot of resources available. I hope you take advantage of all of them. Remember that as we read God's Word, the truth is there. And our goal, our objective in reading God's word is to pull truth from scripture, to, to understand what the original authors meant in their respective context. What we do not want to do is try to add truth to the scripture or change scripture in order to make it line up with what we believe to be the truth is. But we want to take the word of God and pull truth, extract 
truth from the word of God. And so over the next few moments together, I'm going to show you what that looks like as we read through these few verses. So let's look at verse 4. Let's zero in on verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. This is a command, by the way. This isn't a suggestion. This isn't a life coach offering you a motivational tactic for your life. This is a command. Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. And how many of you know that when somebody repeats themselves over and over and over and over and over, there's a few reasons why they would do that, right? One, it's really important. Two, they don't want you to forget. And the Apostle Paul here, he is hammering on this rejoicing thing. Like, he will not let it go. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And we've already talked about how obviously this has nothing to do with what's going on in his life. This has nothing to do with his circumstances. This has nothing to do with his income level or his earthly relationships or what the Enneagram said about him or what character of the office the Facebook quiz said that you are. This has nothing to do with that. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And there's no there, there's no like, like excuse or, or condition to this. Like, I think sometimes we read this and we're like, yeah, okay, so God's telling me to rejoice, but he don't know my circumstance. And it's almost like we want there to be like a tab in our Bible that helps us understand how we're exempt from the commands of God. And in here it's like, rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. Believer, you are commanded to rejoice. But I think so often, I, and I know so often for me, I'm like, yeah, but, but if God really knew what was going on in my life, you know, he wouldn't tell me to rejoice. I have a reason to be unrejoiceful right now. But there's no caveat given. There's no condition given. Rejoice. And what happens, I think, so often is we are tempted to conflate and misunderstand joy because we conflate it with happiness. And we think joy is happiness. And the reality is that happiness depends on what happens, but joy depends on Christ. You ever heard somebody say money can't buy happiness? That's a lie. Money can buy happiness. And if you don't believe it, give me your money and I'll go be happy. Because it, it can buy happiness, bro. It can buy a lot of things that can put a smile on your face. It can solve a lot of your problems by putting a smile on your face. Absolutely money can buy happiness. Don't you ever let no preacher or Christian or motivational speaker tell you money cannot purchase happiness. Bull. Yes, it can. Try me. Let me, let me, I don't even play the lottery, but let me hit that lotto and I'll show you a happier version of me. But here's the truth. You know what it can't purchase? You know what the truth is? It can't purchase joy. It can put a smile on your face and make you happy. And it, can, it, it really, really can. There's a lot of things in this world, there's a lot of things that can happen to you that can cause happiness. The problem is happiness and joy, even if Merriam-Webster's dictionary or thesaurus put them in the same thought, they are not the same. They are different. Happiness depends on what happens. If you put your hope in what happens, you will be happy sometimes and you will be depressed other times. And your emotions will ride the wave of what happens to you. But what I said on social media, what I have said before, what I believe right now is that if you don't learn to control your emotions, your emotions will control you. You have got to learn to control your emotions. You have got to take control of them today. You can no longer allow what happens to you or what is said to you or what they said about you affect you. Because in so doing, you are letting that threaten your happiness. Do they love me? Well, then I'm happy. Oh, now they hate me, so I'm depressed. Oh, they, they accept me, so I am somebody. They reject me, now I'm nobody. And the problem is, is that we allow others to dictate our emotions. And you've got to take control today. And understand, this is the first thing you have to understand. Happiness depends on what happens. But joy depends on Christ. Is Jesus alive? Then I'm fine. Is the tomb empty? Then I'm good. You love me? Great. You hate me? Makes sense. But Jesus is alive. You know what I'm saying? 
You, you accept me as a friend? I'm glad. You reject me? You don't want me to be your friend? I'm cool with that because the tomb's still empty, so I'm good. My hope is in heaven. This ain't my home. Earth is a hotel. It's not my home. I'm passing through. I'm not going to set up camp in this temporary space. I'm going home to be with Jesus. And so I got money in the bank. Great. I've been blessed to be a blessing. I got no money in the bank. God is my provider. You see what I'm saying? Happiness depends on what happens, but joy depends on Christ. Now, this next statement in verse 5 is a continuation of his thought. And I think it is so interesting. And here's what I want you to know. Over the last couple of days, I've been really, really nervous that what's going to happen over the next few moments is something's going to make sense in my head, but make no sense in your head. Has that ever happened to you? Where something is crystal clear up here, but when you explain it, you sound like an idiot? That's possible over the next few moments. And so I apologize in advance. But maybe if there's one of you that is blessed by what I'm about to share with you, I say praise God. Please don't fall asleep. I'll try to get your attention back after this short rant. But right after this command of, of rejoice, immediately following this command of rejoice is verse 5. And he says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. That's so interesting to me because what he does not say is rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Let your giddy excitement be known to everyone. You ever watch Disney's Inside Out? The, the person or the thing that represents joy is this dancing, prancing, twirling and swirling, smile on your face, eternal optimist, everything is rainbows and bubbles. And the problem is if you, if you allow Disney to dictate your theology, you're going to think that's what joy looks like. But here in this passage, he does not say rejoice, twirl everywhere you go. Dance into every room. Just, just paint everything in your mind with rainbows. Every, that's not what he says. So obviously that's not joy. What does he say though? He says rejoice, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Now here's the problem with that when I read that at first. Being reasonable is often a negative thing. or It can have a negative connotation, right? You ever, you ever get out of hand with somebody like, Maybe your expectations are too high. Maybe your dreams are too big. Maybe you're too, too much of an optimist in a moment. And somebody will say to you, come on, be reasonable. Be reasonable. Come back down to earth for a second. You know what I'm saying? So that's usually where I hear that word. That's usually the context by which I hear it. But here, the Apostle Paul is drawing a direct correlation between how reasonable you are and your joy. Why? Because again, happiness depends on what happens. Joy depends on Christ. That word reasonableness is actually a Greek word because the Bible was written, this, this portion of scripture that we're reading, the original language was Greek. It's been translated or transliterated into the English language. And so that word reasonableness is a Greek word that I'm not even going to pretend that I can pronounce. But here's the definition for you. They're gonna put it on the screen. It means having a gentle spirit, being equitable, being fair, and having sound judgment. And I believe that being reasonable, and I've believed this for like four days, so I'm really passionate about it, you know? Because God, I believe God spoke, you know, and he like spoke from his word, and I, I, it just, it changed my perspective. I'm praying it helps you and blesses you. Listen, I believe how reasonable you are directly, directly affects your joy. It's directly correlated to your joy. Again, he says, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say, rejoice. Be reasonable. So here's, here, here's a couple of examples of what I mean. You need examples. Okay. Anybody ever done any work with teenagers? Raised them, been around them, taught them, observed them, served with them? Cool. Teenagers are not reasonable. Correct? If you disagree with me, David at 12.church, send me an email. You're wrong. Teenagers are not reasonable. If something good happens in a teenager's life, they are over the moon. They blow it up to a level that you did not even think was humanly possible. Let a 13-year-old get a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and they're in love. They're going to get married. They're different. I mean, they, 
they are, how dare you tell them at 13 that they do not have a Romeo and Juliet kind of supernatural love? How dare you tell them that God has not brought them together? How dare you tell them that they are not going to grow up, get married, and live happily ever after? Because something good has happened, and they are smitten, they're stricken, and they're in love, and they can't believe it, and they're so happy, and they love their boyfriend or their girlfriend. Let them break up. And then what happens? Uh, nobody loves me and my life is over and now he's gonna date my friend and he liked her Instagram picture and he's stupid and he's a liar and I hate him and it's just a uh, good grief 13 year olds and we've been there we've all been there but something good happens and they go way overboard and you're like chill and then something bad happens, and they go way overboard. You're like, bro, sis, relax, relax. Now, here's what I want to tell you. Most of us, and I say us because I'm including myself in this, we don't grow out of that. And so here, here's what happens. What happens is we see adults that when something good happens, that it's, it's life-changing. Everything is different now. My whole world is better. I'm so much happier. I float into every room that I go in. I, I feel lighter. It's, and it's like, it's like I know you're excited, okay? And I'm not trying to like kill that in you, but what I'm saying is keep it in context. Be reasonable about it. Here's what I mean. When something good happens in your life, the glory should go straight to who? To God, right? We want the glory to go straight to God because we know that every good and perfect gift is from above. And so what's dangerous, though, is when something good happens in our life, we attach our hope, our purpose, and our identity to that thing or that event. And so that works for a moment and makes you happy. But then when that thing is threatened or taken away, all of a sudden that emotion that you attach to it is gone. And so, do I want you to celebrate when something good happens? Yes, of course I do. I'll celebrate with you. Something good happens in your life, then I am like, I'm with you, man. I'm leading the charge in excitement and celebration. Yes and amen. We ought to praise God when good things happen in our life. However, nothing compares to knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Whatever they did for you, Whatever you received, whatever achievement, whatever award, whatever you've accumulated. I mean, you got a raise, a promotion, you got a job, you got a spouse, you got a kid, you got a, you got a the salesman of the year award. Praise God for that. Yes, if you're excited, I'm excited. But don't put your hope in it. And don't attach your identity to it. See it correctly. It's a good gift from God and all the glory goes to him. But I am not going to attach myself to that thing. I'm going to rejoice. And I know that in every time I've been blessed, it's because I am to be a blessing. That's having sound judgment. On the opposite side, something bad happens. The same is true. The same is true. My life is over. No, it's not. No, it's not. Because you have a God who has promised, and who, by the way, attaches his own reputation to that promise, that he will never leave you nor forsake you. That your trust in him means that you don't have temporary life or conditional life, but eternal life. That this Christian life is not you getting it right and holding on to God. It's that God has got it right and he holds on to you. And when something bad happens, we want to see it in a reasonable way with sound judgment. What is going on? I don't know the purpose of it. I don't know why it's happening. I don't know why God has chosen to do this in my life. But I am not going to allow it to mean that my whole life, my whole identity, and my whole purpose is over. So he says rejoice. Rejoice always. Be reasonable. Be reasonable. Which means that where I am in my life is I have joy. And I have joy whether something good happens or something bad happens. 
whether something great happens or something devastating happens, whether I have a lot or I don't have a lot, whether I'm hungry or I'm full, whether I'm rich or I'm poor, whether I don't know what's happening or I'm familiar with the situation because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, which is later on in this verse. It just continues on his thought later on in this passage. Excuse me. It's this reasonableness. Celebrate, yes. Mourn, of course. But know that nothing you could ever celebrate over gives you joy. Your joy is in Christ. And nothing that ever happens to you could ever threaten your joy because your joy is not tied to what happened, but your joy is in Christ. He then goes on. He says, do not be anxious about anything. Easy to say, isn't it? Like that's a terrible thing to say to somebody who's anxious, isn't it? Like if you, you had a patient that comes into a therapist's office, I'm really anxious. Listen, don't be anxious. That'll be $80. Pay, pay her on your way out, right? Like that doesn't help, bro. That doesn't help. Gentlemen, don't look at your wife. Look right up here and don't say amen. But I know you know what I'm talking about. It's like when your wife is upset and you tell her to calm down. Does that ever work? No. And so here, this is like half of, don't be anxious. God bless, guys. Don't be anxious. Happy 2023. It's like, it's like, it's like that's not helpful to me, Pastor. Don't be anxious. I'm anxious about a lot of things. But in everything by what? In everything by what? In everything by what? Prayer. It's like almost like we've been talking about this for a while on our social media. We've been talking about this today, that we're a people of prayer. And obviously there's an answer to our anxiety. Did you know that you don't have to deal with your anxiety today? You can actually answer it in prayer. Oh, but oh, Pastor David, I don't, I don't like to bother God with stupid things that are going on in my life. That's the enemy. It's a lie straight from the pits of hell and the devil himself. Listen, God is not like us in that his attention is divided. Because God is worried about what's going on on the other side of the world, that does not mean he doesn't have time for you. Because what makes him God is that all of his attributes are perfectly present all of the time for all of eternity. Which means when you talk to him, he hears you. And not only does he hear you, he responds. Do not be anxious in anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And what will happen? What will happen if every time you are met with anxiety or you encounter something that makes you anxious, you answer in prayer, what happens? It says in verse 7, the peace of God. And how many of us could use the peace of God today? With the political climate, with the, with the voices on social media, with what might be going on in your family, what might be going on in your community, what might be going on in the world. How many of us could use the peace of God today? It surpasses all understanding and it will guard your hearts. If you, if you write in your Bible, you need to circle, underline, highlight, put a box around that word, heart. When you read heart in scripture, you have to understand that you, you're not reading about the blood pumping muscle in the center of your chest. Sometimes in the Bible, when there's a reference to someone's heart, that is what they're talking about. But like in this situation, that's not what he's talking about. When he says heart, he's talking about something different other than the physical muscle in the center of your chest. Unfortunately, we have sort of, I don't know, like made Christianity a little bit immature and the way we explain Jesus to kids is we say, open the door of your heart. Have you heard us say that? Have you heard people say that before? Open the door of your heart and let Jesus in. Like, and, and it doesn't really even make any sense, but it's something that we say. It's just something that, you know, it kind of becomes part of our, our verbiage. What we're saying, what, what's trying to be said is that your heart is not the blood pumping muscle in the center of your, it's not, we're not talking about opening a valve of your heart and wishing Jesus in like he's a vampire right? That's not what we mean. What we're saying is, when we say heart, what we mean is what the authors of scripture mean, that the heart in scripture is the epicenter of your emotions. The heart is the epicenter. It's the source of, it's the, it's, it's sort of 
the, the part of you that is, is what makes you human? Like how many of you know that as human beings we have emotions that animals don't have, right? We have emotions that rocks and trees and bugs and mountains and oceans, they don't have. There's this, there's this thing about humanity that can sort of be hard to describe. And what the Bible is saying is, that's your heart. But wait a minute, lizards and monkeys and frogs and dogs and lions, they have hearts. But that's not what we're meaning. What we mean is the epicenter of your emotions. What, 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 what produces the emotions in you? And here it says that your heart, the epicenter of your emotions, will be guarded, will be protected, will be held. There will be a, 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 a barrier around your heart in order to ensure your heart's purity and safety. And how does that get there? From the peace of God. Well, how do we get the peace of God? By prayer. And how often should we pray? as often as we encounter any sort of thing that might threaten our emotions. Here he says, don't be anxious, but be in prayer. Everything in prayer and thanksgiving, make your request known to God. And in so doing, the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart, will guard your emotions. And so here's what I want you to receive as we end our time together. If today your heart is exposed, your joy will be threatened. If your heart is exposed, your joy will be threatened. Today, you have got to make the decision to guard your heart. You have to. You've got to today say, I'm gonna guard my heart. Starting today, my heart, the epicenter of my emotions, the seat of my emotions, the source of my emotions, will be guarded and protected by the peace of God that passes even my own understanding. And how is that going to happen? Through prayer, through prayer. That I'm going to pray in any and all circumstances. I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna respond to everything that happens with prayer and thanksgiving. If that doesn't happen, then you will never experience the kind of joy I'm talking about because every social media post will threaten your joy. You'll see a post by somebody, and don't act like you ain't been there. You'll see a post from somebody, they're on vacation, they all match. His arms around her, God, their kids are smiling. And where are they? Look at those mountains and that ocean. They, wow. The perfect, beautiful American family. But the reason you're scrolling through your phone is because you're in the middle of an argument with your spouse. And you're in your room on your phone trying to get away from your crazy kids who are not clean or smiling. And seeing that post if your heart's not guarded, it's going to threaten your joy. You want to know why? Because all of a sudden, seeing that post means, well, I, I'm not like her. I'm not like him. My kids aren't like that. I'm not even sure where that is in the world. Much less could I afford a plane ticket there. And your joy is threatened. If your heart's not guarded, when your friend gets blessed, you're going to wonder why you're not blessed. Rather than rejoicing with them, it's going to be a pity party for you because you didn't get the blessing that you thought, you know, you deserved. And, but today, your heart can be guarded by the peace of God that passes all understanding. And how's it going to get there? How are you going to build that guard around your heart? Prayer. Throw that slide back up there for me with that QR code on it for prayer, if you would. Again, I want to remind you. Even if you've never prayed in your life, there is a God who is for you, who is here for you, and when you speak to him, he listens. And you have people sitting around you, people all around this campus who are wanting to pray with you and for you. Maybe today's the day where you need to come forward at the end of our time together to our people that are gonna be up here to receive prayer 
with somebody and their arms wrapped around you, or maybe you're not at all into that. And I would encourage you to take that step of scanning that code, fill out that, that uh, prayer card to say, I need some help, I need some prayer, I need somebody to agree in the Lord with me. We are here for you to do that. And today, if you'll begin that rhythm of prayer, you're gonna begin to see the peace of God come into your life that will surpass all understanding and your heart will be fortified, will be protected, it'll be guarded and your joy will be untouchable. Would you stand with me as we pray together to close our time? Jesus, thank you. Thank you for joy. <laughs> thank you that as followers of Jesus, as believers, we are not threatened by what happens, but our joy is found in you and in you alone. God, may we be a people who are marked by prayer, who are marked by the joy we have in Jesus Christ. That whatever comes our way, that whatever happens, good or bad, it doesn't threaten the hope we have in you, the joy we have in you. God, I pray that as we pray, as we begin a rhythm of prayer, that you would begin to make it obvious that the peace of God is beginning to come into our lives and that our hearts might be guarded from the things that might threaten our emotions. Lord, may we take control of our emotions today lest our emotions take control of us. God, we thank you and we praise you for the opportunity we've had. And so now as we close our time together, we worship you and praise you, not just for all you've done, but for who you are. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said.